Good afternoon. This is your Pan-African show called Africa with your host, Kasarawak Seifu. Today, I have to admit, I've gotten the opportunity to actually talk to, uh, I would like to say, my brother, because he's a Pan-African brother of ours from close by. Could you please introduce yourself? And I would like to say welcome to our show. Brother, I love your name. Can, can you repeat again? Kasala. Yeah. Kasala. Yes. Oh, man. That's a, that's a beautiful name. Thank you. Oh, my name is Mika Chavala, and I, I was born in Tanzania, but right now I'm here in Ethiopia. I'm an African, and I'm the founder of Swahili Nation One Africa Foundation. Yeah, it's good to be back home. Brilliant. And it's good to meet you. Yes. I'm, I'm your little brother. I think exactly. <laughs> I've talked about you. I also have a radio show, okay. which I've been hosting for the last 15 years. Oh. It's also called Afrikaan, which is we Africans. And I think it was three years ago when we discovered you. Oh. And I've actually wow. even had your voice being heard on the radio. Really? And wow. It was kind of exciting to find other Africans actually mm. fighting the same fight. You yeah. know what I mean? You're yeah. on the same page. Indeed. As Indeed. opposed to so separated by a lot yeah. of other things. So welcome. Uh, thank you so much. I'm here to pick up the stick. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Thank you so much. Now, since we do know so much about you, mm. and now my show, obviously, you haven't been on it, so I would mm. like you to slowly <laughs> describe you, what you do, yeah. and what you would like to do. Yeah. Well, um, as I said, I'm, a, I'm an African, and what I do right now is we are trying to unite our people, and we have this uh, foundation called Swell Nation One Africa, basically the goal of... Our foundation is to unite our people inside the continent and outside the continent as well because we have a lot of our brothers and sisters who um, were taken a long time ago. They're living outside of Africa, but they're part of us. Um, and uh, so we are trying to bring everybody together through what we are doing, you know, through different you know, uh, platforms and different ways and different initiatives. Uh, that's basically what I've been trying to do for the past three years on the camera. Uh, but before that, I was just, because I lived in South Korea, I was doing pretty much the same thing, but it was, it was more uh, like person to person. Like, you know, you, you see the problem and you go, you try to fix it, you try to solve it. Yeah, but you know, three years ago, that's when I started to do this publicly. And I guess that's when you found me. I know, right? <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Now, Ethiopia means so much to you. Yes. And the reason, it could be that all the other African brothers also have that same feeling, but I did yeah. not get the opportunity yeah. to even hear them uh, really expressing themselves. Yeah. So I would like to know, at what point did mm. you fall in love with Ethiopia? Or Ethiopia has always been yeah. a part of you? Well, three years ago, when I started to do reaction on Ethiopian music, that's when I found out about this beautiful culture of Ethiopia. Before that, to be honest, I didn't know much about Ethiopia. Okay. I didn't even get to hear a single music from Ethiopia okay. throughout my life. And I had my friend from Ethiopia. I met him in 2013. We are studying together. We live in the same room. I tried the food back then. But I, I don't know. I was just, it was just like, it was kind of like just another nation mm -hmm. that um, I was not interested on. I didn't even know that I was not interested on. But... Three years ago, I was doing some reactions of Tanzania and other countries, and then I realized that Ethiopia is East Africa, but I've never heard anything from Ethiopia, mm -hmm. even in my country. You know, I've never heard anyone playing anything. So I was like, let me try to react on one of the music. And I did that, and I just fell in love from the start. <laughs> and from, from that point onward, like, the rest is story. But I think that's how I... Through music? Is when you... <laughs> yeah, because I'm a musician too. That's when I began to love Ethiopia. Ah, you are a musician also. Yes. Since you did reactions on Ethiopian music, what was the first music or the first singer's music that you actually covered? Yeah, actually, I need to memorize that because I always get this question and, um, you know, um, the first song I did, it was... This one guy, he's, he's very young, Ethiopian. It sounds like 
East African music. It sounds like, you know, Tanzanian music. Is it the melody, the rhythm that got to you? It, exactly. The melody and the is. rhythm. And I was like, yeah. oh, this is Ethiopian music. And then the next reaction, it was Teddy Afro. Yeah, because I saw you on that one. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's when I was like, oh, my oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, most of the time I say Teddy Afro because I forget the first one. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I had heard at some point uh, somebody had asked you mm. if there were a few people that you wanted to meet in Ethiopia. Yeah. And the names that you had listed, I actually went down the list and I'm like, I was 100% sure you had met two of them. Yeah. Which was Dr. Avi uh -huh. and Rofna. Because uh -huh. Rofna just had a concert oh, and yeah. you were yeah. there. So I'm yeah. hoping you met him then. Yeah, I met Rofna, yes. And then our prime minister uh -huh. was at a meeting that you were in a few days ago. Yes. Did you get that chance? You know, I <laughs> didn't get a chance to shake his hand. But you saw But him. I saw him okay. because we were taking pictures together in a group and people they were just jumping to him. Uh -huh. Like people that just all over him. So I was standing there and looking at this guy next to me and I was like, oh, this is him. <laughs> And I was like, my time will come. Yeah, so I just <laughs> humbly, I went back to my seat. And I was like, you know, the time will come. Yeah, yes, yeah. It will. but at least, you know. There's a place at least to be in the same room and yeah. to see him is right there. I was just looking at him all this time. And it was, it was amazing. It was fascinating to, to see him there. Yeah. So the third person you had mentioned was Teddy Afro. Teddy Afro. Yeah, man. Like, I met his wife, you know, in one of the events a couple months ago. And she said that, hey, we, we watch your reaction, you know, sometimes. And I was so like, they know oh. of you. <laughs> yes, I was like, I hope, like, I hope I can, can see your husband one day. <laughs> but he's the hard man to find. Yeah. Like you said, one day, God mm, winning. One day, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to come back to a more serious question. I love that. <laughs> what do you think of our African leaders? African leaders. You being the oh, yeah. youth, you mm -hmm. being out there. Yeah. What's your feeling? Are we doing the right thing? Oh, you know, before I used to be very critical mm -hmm. with them which I am still until right now, but um, right now I think a little bit different because working for Swahili Nation for three years, um, you know, the more you love Africa and you work for Africa, the more you discover so many things that, you know, some of them, they walk away from it. Some of them, they even get more passion to fight, right. you know, for it. So for me, I get more like energy to fight for it because I see so many things that are deep within undercover that a lot of people they don't see, they don't understand. And so when it comes to our leaders, I think they're in a very difficult position. Mm -hmm. I, like I, I can sense that because even me myself, just with my small organization, I see the position I am in attacks from every side. Exactly. And sometimes, you know, one day I, I filmed one video I share on my Twitter and I said, sometimes the only solution, the only decision you have is either to choose 10 people to die or 100 people to die. So I was asking people like, which option are you going to take out of there? And I'm not, I'm not here to defend them, but I realized that the pressure that Africa we have from the outside, because after independent, it kind of like Africa, we are not really independent economically today. Exactly. And so because of that, it's kind of like there's this like uh, string attached with the West and East. And at the same time, your people expect you to do things without depending there. And cutting these roots and all this connection, it has been there for many years, for like 60 years or 50 years. Mm. How are you going to do it? And Africa, we are not united. If you decide to stand alone, you're going to have sanction. Maybe medicines, they're not going to be shipped to you because we still depend on the West and all those stuff. So there's so many politics around, around them. And sometimes it, it makes it very difficult for them to do the right thing, even though their intention is to do the right thing. And so well, one decision that I've decided for myself, I say that I want to be loyal to my people and I want to be loyal to my leaders. I'm going to question them. I'm going to ask them. I'm going, I'm going to keep them accountable with everything they say, everything they do, but I'm not going to turn away from them unless they're gone away from the leadership. As long as they're there leading at that moment, they've been elected demo democratically, I will, I, will, I will stay with them and I'll try to contribute to the development of what you know they are doing Excellent. instead of uh, working against them and being disloyal because they're facing a lot of stuff. They are, or even judging them for that matter. Yes. We can't sit on this side and say, yeah. he didn't do this, he should have done this. Yeah. Because like you said, we have no clue. 
No clue. No None clue. Whatsoever. We, we only see the we only see what is happening on the outside. Exactly. But when you go in the inside, and I mean it's it's top secret, so you cannot know. But I think sometimes they pray and wish that we understand what they're going through. It's not easy to lead like a country of in, in my country we have like sixty one million people or one hundred and something million or two hundred. <laughs> it's not easy and they need to do their work. They need to you know, try their best at least so that we may have like the common ground between the people and them. Uh, but also we need to, you know, to somehow understand and be patient with them. Yeah. That's yeah. what I say too. We have to be patient. It's given, we've elected them. They're yeah. in that office. Yeah. Let them do their job yeah. instead of us out here saying, he didn't do this, she didn't do this. Mm, that's true. Mm. So how can Africans, how do you think we can be proud? Mm. Because there's a lot of stuff has been done. Yeah. So for an African to walk in his country with his head held high and yeah. yeah. being proud of them ourselves. That's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good question. You know, I think uh, just the fact that we are African, that should be the first reason for us to be proud. Thank right? you. Because this is where the, the humankind, the history began. Yes. And... Our story began with us as a kings and not as slaves. You know, just with that fact, just because your identity is African, you should be proud. You know, you're proud. Somebody else want to take advantage of you, but we are still here standing. Mm -hmm. You know, someone came to colonize you and all this stuff, but we are still here standing. You know, someone is still exploiting you, but we are still here standing. So there's a lot of things to be proud because we are strong, we are smart, we are beautiful, wonderfully made. You know what I'm saying? And... Uh, but I think apart from that, uh, we don't just need to dwell on the history and what happened in the past, but I think we need to, to, to actualize, you know, all these ideas that we have today in our daily lives. You know, I have three principles in my life and it's, you know, preparations, details and time. That in everything that I do, I have to well prepare myself. If it is knowledge, if it is skills, if it is whatever, I need to do that. I need to focus on the details, small things that a lot of people, they don't pay attention to. I need to focus like, you know, like, you know, those kind of stuff and time. I need to keep time because time is more precious than money or than anything else. And I feel like the reason why Africa, we kind of like delaying in our development, it's because we do not really care about time. Mm. You know, most of the time we, you know, we, we, we call African time, but, mm. you know, I rebuke that Thank you. So in the I. name of the... God. Thank you. I, so I do I. I that in the name of Jesus, yeah. if I can say no. that. But, <laughs> but yeah, I rebuke that because I keep time. Yeah. So it's, it's not African time. It's, mm. it's the culture that, it's not ours. You know what I'm saying? But it's a culture that we, we, we kind of like got used to it and it become our you know, daily routine. But I don't want that. And I hope our leaders and our people also, we'll, we'll focus on that and we'll really, uh, you know, keep time because you cannot fight with time. No, you can't. Yeah. Ethiopian Airlines. Mm. You know, it's Africa's pride. Mm. How is Ethiopian Airlines changing the narratives mm. of African image? Yeah. <laughs> that's Africa's that, image. That's a really good question because it just reminded me I had an interview with... Uh, the manager of Ethiopian airline in South Korea. And, you know, we're talking about all this stuff that what they're doing. I think one thing that I believe that it will transform Africa or continent is institutions, Insti institutionalization of Africa. Uh, when you go to all this uh, so-called developed country, mm -hmm. you will see that the change that has been made in the countries is not because of the government, but mainly it's because of the institutions. institutions. So government provide a platform for private sectors, you know, local, you know, sectors to actually, uh, you know, to create the institutions, schools, hospitals, roads, and all this stuff. You know, I lived in South Korea for nine years. That country has been transformed by private sectors, by companies like, you know, if I can name them. Can I name yeah. them? Yeah, like Samsung, Hyundai, Kia, and so many others just in, you know, South Korea. So I think... When you look at Ethiopian, you, you see uh, that institution that can actually bring about change uh, to the country, but as well to the continent, because nobody can argue that Ethiopian airline is the, is the first airline here in Africa, and also is competing internationally outside of Africa, which is 
amazing. I've seen in South Korea what they're doing. And so you see like they have like, uh, you know, aviation academy, you know, which they're transforming it to university. You know, they have like hotel one, you know, it, it seems to be like it's going to be one of the biggest hotel in mm -hmm. Africa because they're still expanding it. So all these different stuff, I think they, they can contribute to the, um, you mean, to the country's uh, economy. But not only that, when you look at Africa at large, you know, today you can go anywhere in Africa by using Ethiopian Airlines. So in a way, Ethiopian Airlines is Pan-African Airlines Absolutely. for me. That's how I see it because it's Absolutely. connecting the entire continent together. And not only that, it's connecting the continent with the rest of the world, mm -hmm. which is like uh, they need to be, you know, uh, supported. They need to be um, applauded and if you are an African, you better use Ethiopian airline. Exactly. All right? <laughs> you see, now, I, yeah. I completely agree. And mm. the other thing is, you mm. really don't have other choices. Oh, yeah. yeah uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, my concern <laughs> is, when yeah. you come to the other side, when there's competition, mm. there's, it's always good for the customers. Because tickets... You can, you can shop around. But mm. currently, we only have one. And the flights are very expensive trying to go. Like, That's if true. I wanted to go visit Tanzania versus yeah. Ghana, yeah. I mean, the prices That's are not, true. like, uh, competitive. That and they true. can't be competitive because they are the only ones. Exactly. That's true. <laughs> so how can we mm. convince them? <laughs> mm. Not really convince them, but mm. work with them where there is a way... Mm. Because I've always talked about, we have to travel to each other's countries. Yeah. And in order to do that, yeah. I don't want to go with Lufthansa. Exactly, yeah. You know what I mean? Indeed, I would definitely indeed. want to take Ethiopian Airlines yeah. or mm. Kenyan Airways yeah. or mm. one of our own. Yeah, yeah, indeed. So what do you think is the best way for Africans to travel to other African countries, price-wise? Yeah. You know, th that's why I'm fighting for One Africa, because mm -hmm. I hope right now we had like a railway system all across Africa continent, connecting all of us together, because yes. that would be a competition. That would be, absolutely. Some other people, <laughs> they would just love to take a train, you Thank know, you. here and there. So for the airline, of course, they will rethink about their price again, yeah. because I think one thing that I have issue with the business is that a lot of business, they're looking for, you know, creating a profit more than caring about the customers, which I'm always against, even though myself i'm a businessman like you know I, I you know i studied economics and you know i have a lot of ideas of business i'm trying to actualize them um and so i think that would be one of the ways to kind of like you know keep them accountable but also i think you know promoting our other african airlines you know like um if you say we have kenyan airlines we have actually tanzanian airlines uh we have rwanda we have south african if all of these different airlines in their countries, you know, can be promoted in a way, mm -hmm. you know, to so that we may not just have one choice, but we may have varieties of choices because all are Africans, right? Exactly. So at the end of the day, we have to support Africans. Exactly. How do you yes. get to West Africa? Ethiopian airline. Exactly. How much do you pay? Oh, God. You I know, have... sometimes it's cheaper to go to Europe or, exactly. or America. The reason why I'm bringing, and I'm actually even yeah. sticking on this subject is yes. because, mm -hmm. you know, Mm. When you make it comfortable and mm. easy for me to travel yeah. within Africa, yeah. it's the only time I'm going to do that. Indeed. Indeed. But if I'm paying 1200 to go to U.S. or Paris, yeah. and you're asking mm. maybe 1300 to go to Mauritius yeah. or Seychelles, yeah. where am I going to choose? Indeed. Unfortunately, Indeed. the other one wins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how do we convince uh. our sisters and brothers uh. to pay just more extra uh, to go here. You know, I think I think that's almost impossible because uh, majority of Africans we don't have that money. No. You know, the other day we were talking about foreign investment in the countries. For example, I was looking at the investment policy in Ethiopia. You need to have two hundred thousand USD to invest. So basically, only billionaires can do that. Yeah. You know, you cannot really have no people to do that. So I think uh, for that we need to we need to convince Ethiopian yes. airline. I think so. To rethink about that or maybe to to give even some promotions you know so that can support uh, our people and can encourage the traveling from one country to another country within the continent so you know um i spoke to uh, another person i was interviewing she actually had a traveling mm -hmm. uh, company mm -hmm. and we talked about this and one of the things that i thought would be a good thing is mm -hmm. having one of the conversations we thought mm -hmm. I mean, we had, we thought it was a good idea was, what if they had like 
you know, like all the others, we've seen all the Europeans and Americans, when they do their airlines, when they want people, when they're being competitive, yeah. they have like nice fares. Mm. You know, might be going to Las Vegas, might be going to Paris, yeah. whatever. Mm. So why couldn't they have yeah. discounted fares, like yeah. seasonal discounted fares? Yeah. Go to seashells with yeah. the da 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 Then I would be excited to go to seashells as oh. opposed to Paris. You know what I mean? Because we have That's some so beautiful true. islands. That's so true. I, I, and, and that it could be the way of promoting, you know, Thank Africa's you. units, yeah. you know, by doing something like that and also promoting internal, you know, I mean, uh, domestic uh, tourism. Because it know? encourages each other. Exactly. Yeah. People they are like, oh, I can go there by this money. I'm going to go there. Yeah. We need, I think we need that. That's brilliant. Yeah. Ethiopian airline. We should suggest it to them. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So now I come to our diasporas. You actually mentioned it earlier, which I truly yes. appreciate because sometimes I think they've forgotten. Yeah, yeah. You know, I usually uh, play African-American music mm. uh, on my radio show and sometimes mm. they call me and ask me, why aren't you playing African music? Mm. I'm like, excuse me? This is African this music. This is African music. <laughs> I'm like, no, they're from America. I'm like, aha, uh -huh. you see? <laughs> it's yeah. a problem. Yeah. And then recently I got introduced to Professor James Small, mm -hmm. who's an African-American activist. Yeah. Very interesting. You know what he said? Yeah. And he's talking about his African-American mm. brothers and sisters. Yeah. He said, African-Americans are mm. forgotten. Mm. He said, and it's really hard, quite honestly. He said, mm. we have no mother, mm. we have no father. Mm. We actually literally fend for ourselves. We have mm. no other African country mm. that says, okay, who did what to the African Americans, whatever, whatever's going on in whichever state. Yeah. He says, there's nobody that questions when a brother dies. Mm. Nobody calls and says, or says, or even the AU for that matter mm. says, okay, what's going on with, you know, the killings yeah, here. Yeah. They don't want that relationship. They've never wanted it. And we haven't figured it out. We still think we can pick sides. We can come and join with the French, or we can join with the Americans, or we can join with the British. We think we can pick sides. Close your eyes and look at the 54 nations in Africa and open your eyes and see if you pick the side that's worthy of picking. Coming back to my question, mm. how do you see the African diasporas? Would you say they have as much responsibility mm. as the Africans in Africa mm. changing the narratives. Absolutely. I always say this, that um, Africa is one big family with 55 different children, yeah. 54 countries in Africa and one diaspora. <laughs> we are one. <laughs> uh, so I always say, and I always believe that because I once, you know, I, I am a diaspora, by the way, lived outside for nine years. I was kind of, you know, I was not born there, but yeah, you uh, lived as a diaspora there. in that sense. Um, and I think you know, and I, and I think there's a balance here. I, I tweeted about this before that, you know, for example, when you have diaspora coming back home, then they should be, of course, willing to, to learn the culture and to interact with the people um, and to be among the local people, right? I've seen in some region that, you know, some of them, they move back in the continent and they just have their own community as a diaspora in Africa. So they, they don't really interact with the local people. They don't understand the language or they don't even learn. And so you still have the gap. The same gap we have right now between Africa and diaspora, we have in the continent now. And also us as lenders here, Africans in the continent, we have responsibility as well to accept, to open our hearts, uh, you know, towards our brothers and sisters, knowing that they are us, mm. right? And embrace them and not feel intimidated by them because we have that, you know, thing like you're just intimidated. Oh, maybe he's from this. Oh, it might be better. Like that, mm. that kind of intimidation, it should not be there. Oh, the fear. If we all play our part, I think it will be very easy for us to come together and, you know, to, 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 to unite. Um, and I think... Uh, so whether you are diaspora in the continent or outside of the continent, you still have a, uh, a big role to contribute to the, uh, you know, Africa's economy or Africa's growth by maybe investing or create institutions or even moving back to the continent. Mm. And I think also the governments in the continent, African Union, whatever, they should also have a, a space for our people. We were talking about this yesterday and we say, our African countries, most of African countries, we don't allow to have like double citizenship. Yes. But it's a time to allow to give that to our diaspora people. Mm. Because most of them, they want to have that 
Africa identity on the paper so that they may be able to come home anytime or as well to leave. So I think we have responsibility to provide that to them, even if we do not allow, but for diaspora, it has to be exceptional, you know, both in the, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in, the, in the continent or even in the African Union, because right now I'm pushing for one passport. And so I think we should... Exactly. We should. I, was to, I, was, I was going to ask you about that one. Oh, then I'm going to hold on <laughs> for that question. <laughs> no, no, you can actually... Yeah. You yeah. know, when you ask that question, I would like to know where you were, yeah. what even pushed you, what, yeah. why, why did you think, yeah. out of all the questions that yeah. you had, it was so important <laughs> to actually mention yeah. the one, uh, the passport. Exactly. You know, <laughs> I've, I've thought about this before, but that day when I, when I went to the African Union headquarters, there's a, you know, I've always been bashing so much on African Union again and tag them on Twitter. But that day when I went there, again, there's a special energy I felt yeah. in that room. And I, I, I saw all these pictures of the founders of yeah. OAU and I got special feeling, you know, just being in that presence and just remembering every, you know, all the sacrifice ancestors made. And um, so I was, I was sitting, I was, I was actually not supposed to talk because I was there <laughs> as a media personality. People who they were supposed to talk, they, are, they were appointed by the government to come, uh -huh. all the youth, by the president. So they came, we had like two Tanzanians there, and I was sitting just right across this Tanzanian guy, and he was about to speak, so I asked him, I said, hey man, can you divide up your time? Exactly, can <laughs> I have half of it? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. He was gracious enough, he was like, oh yes, I'll, you know, we can do that. So he, you know, he, he contributed and then he gave me a chance, and at that moment, when I was just talking, I was asking myself, well, we have African Union and we have 55 members of this organization. We have leaders are meeting here every single year, maybe twice. I don't know. These guys are so close than you think. Like African leaders, they're very close. They talk to each other. Maybe they have even a WhatsApp group. I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> but why our people, why we're we not doing that the same thing to our people? And yeah. I feel like our people, we, we need that sense, that a feeling of unity among ourselves. Right now, if I go to the northern part of Africa, I feel like I'm not in Africa. Yeah. When I look at them, I feel like they're not African. How can we bring that, that, at least that feeling that, you know, once you have that feeling, that feeling is what draws you close to somebody, True. right? You fall in love with someone because you have that feeling first and then you go close to, you talk to them. So if we have a single or common African Union passport, man, like all of Africans, we have it. We are like, oh yeah. Good. Okay, I don't, I don't care how you look. Show me your password. You know, know. like they, know. it will create, so exciting. <laughs> exactly, it will create a sense of unity among yeah. ourselves, and it will remind us that we are African, regardless of our countries, regardless of our colors or our tribes and all those stuff. But the interesting thing is, African Union passport. It was introduced in 2016. And it was like all the leaders actually they do. They have do it. have it. They do have it, and the plan it was to give to our people. In 2018, yeah. but it never happened. So this is a question to African Union. What really happened? <laughs> Why we don't have it? I did a research. I asked our people that how many people would be willing to pay for African Union passports as a gesture to support yes, or to fund our organization. Because if we want Africa solution to African problem, then we need to fund African Union and not the West. 96%, I had like more than 1,000 people voted, 96%. They said we're willing to pay. to pay for it. Only 4%, pretty much maybe they're not African, they choose, they say, we are not, <laughs> willing, not, to, we are not willing to pay for it. So I tagged Africa and as Africa, you know, what is the excuse? Yeah. Come with a plan, tell us how much we need to pay. And we, we will pay. We'll pay. We are going to organize our youth so that we can pay for that to support our fund. Mm -hmm.